Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. So uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I would like to start by thanking the organizer for this great conference and uh, Marsha for the invitation, the Human Society at Troy for the organization. So today I'm going to talk to you about the project I've been working on in the Rota Lab in the last couple of years. So most of those data are published. We recently published them. But I would also try to give a general overview about the uh, potential and limitation of human brain organoids for disease modeling. So human brain organoids derive from human pluripotent stem cells, and they come in different flavor. So as you can see in here, we have um, different kind of organoids, some that are patterned, and this means that we can generate specific brain regions, such as, for example, hippocampus, or fourth brain, or midbrain, and so on. Or we can have organoids that are not patterned, and this means that, in theory, they have the potential to generate every different cell in the brain and in the CNS in general. So, so far, uh, brain organoids have been used mostly to, um, to mimic and to model early stages of human brain development. And the pathologies that have been modeled so far have been mostly like Zika virus infection and microcephaly. So we have, uh, we have heard Patricia and Steven talking about modeling of Zika virus infection yesterday. But in our lab, we are interested mostly in uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. And neuropsychiatric disorders are disorders of high brain function. And so also, these are disorders that also affect later stages of human brain development. And so for this reason, when I joined the lab, I decided to try to extend the timing culture of those organoids. Because, as I said, uh, before basically we published this protocol, um, Lancaster and in the Knoblik lab published the first protocol on human brain organoids, but this protocol only allows culture of human brain organoids for up to three months, three, four months. So I uh, changed a bit the protocol that, early, that was earlier published by the Knoblik lab, and here, for those of you that are not really familiar with this technique, I'm going to try to explain what basically we do. So we start from monolayer uh, culture of pluripotent cells, and then we dissociate those cultures in, into single cells. We plate in this 96 well um, about 2,000 cells. And then we make embryoid bodies. So after we make embryoid bodies, we transfer them and we do neural induction. And then we uh, embed them in matrigel. And uh, you can see that after the embedding in matrigel, you can see these buds of uh, neuroactoderm forming. After this, we transfer them to the spinner by the reactor, and they can survive up to nine months in presence of neurotrophins, such as BDNF. Um, yeah, so um, as I said, these organoids have really the potential to generate every cell type in the brain, because they are not patterned. And so what we did at the beginning to characterize them, we did some staining uh, for different brain regions. So this is like um, the, 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 the human brain um, at the beginning of uh, the development. So this is like a neural tube, and there are different regions of the human brain that you can see here. And so we stain our organoids for markers such as PAC6. PAC6 is, PAC6 is a marker of dorsal progenitor cells. So you can see here that the organoids make this sort of fluid-filled cavities that resemble the ventricles of the human brain. And you can see that PAC6 uh, progenitors are lining those ventricles, uh, similar to what happened actually in the human brain. And then you can see also uh, progenitors of the ventral foot brain that are possible for NKX2.1, and also markers for other brain regions, such as OTX2 and marker of ventral foot brain. Um, so then we also did a characterization of different stages of these organoids with immunofluorescence, and so you can see that organoids over time express different markers of progenitor cells, such as PAC6, and also marker of uh, different neuronal markers, of different neuronal subtypes, as you can see. And then you can see that over time, organoids also start to express marker of glial cells. So at the beginning, for example, at one month, you don't really see expression of glial cell marker, such as, for example, GFAP, but then over time, you see expression. And this is actually also mirrors what happens in the human fetal brain as well, because glial cells are generated later compared to neurons. So uh, here I show you some pictures of what is you know, 
uh, what is the developmental uh, sequence of uh, generation of different cell types in these brain organoids. But the, re the reality is that because in the human brain organoids we have different cell types, um, it's very diff difficult just with immunostaining to understand what are the cell types that are present in the organoids. Because, for example, PAC6 that in the cortex labels progenitors of the forebrain, in the retina labels a lot of different kinds of neurons. So when you have such a complicated system, you can't really use immunofluorescence to understand which kind of cell types you have in there. And so um, um, what we did, so I'm gonna go through this. So uh, what we did, we decided to team up with the lab of Steve McCarroll at the Broad Institute and to perform large-scale single cell sequencing of those organoids. And so we use this video that is called droplet sequencing. This is actually, I invite you to read this paper because it's a relatively cheap way to do single cell sequencing. And so this basically allowed us to build the biggest, largest map that has ever been published of uh, uh, single cell sequencing. So uh, we sequenced up to 67,000 cells and uh, um, we took those cells from uh, 19 organoids that were six months old and that came from four distinct bioreactors. And so, uh, as I said, I invite you to read this publication. Well, basically, uh, the way this works is that you basically uh, run these cells, your cells, in this microfluidic chamber and then um, in the chamber there is formation of this droplet and so each cell is combined with these beads that are coated with primers and so basically when you lyse the droplet the RNA from each cell will bind to the beads and so basically you can do sequencing of all these beads in parallel and so this really reduces the cost a lot of the single cell sequencing and uh, yeah, so after uh, the sequencing so this is what you get. This is a map of these 67,000 cells, and this is the space that these cells occupy, and this is just a two-dimensional reduction of all the cells that we have sequenced. And so as you can see, uh, the, these cells um, cluster in 10 D groups based on similarity of their transcription and profile. And so uh, what we found, we were able to identify these cells, and so we understood the identity of these cells. And uh, of these 10 clusters, 9 out of these 10 clusters belong to CNS cell types, including forebrain and retina. The only cell types that was not CNS was basically this cluster that, um, and here you can see some mesodermal precursors. And uh, um, yeah, so another thing that I think it's a real issue in the field, in the organoids field, is really try to understand the organoids to organoid heterogeneity because um, no one really knows how similar these organoids are. They do not look very similar. When you look at them in the flask, they, the, their size is slightly different, and you can see also that they are they have different in pigmentation and so on. So we were really interested in understanding this organoid to organoid heterogeneity, and we found, so here you see this plot. You see our 19 organoids, and you see that each organoid is labeled with a different color. And so as you can see, there are clusters that are represented in each organoid, and they are mostly <coughs> progenitors, they are cells, and also retina is most of the time there. But then if you look, for example, at the forebrain cluster here, <coughs> only 30% of the organoids have it in, in there. And for example, for us, forebrain cluster was very important because uh, neuropsychiatric disorders mostly affect uh, forebrain. And so basically this is, I think, something that needs to be acknowledged and needs to be considered in the field. These organoids are not really identical. And so something that we thought to decrease this level of variability is to use reported lines. So for example, um, fluorescent reported lines can, that can report for, for brain, for example, and then just pick organoids that express this um, for brain market. We also noticed that there is a sort of flask to flask uh, heterogeneity. And so if you, for the same, if you are doing an experiment, it's better to use organoids from the plane, same flask for consistency. So, yeah. Okay, so we decided then to look at higher resolution at the cell types containing this forebrain cluster. And as you can see in here, we found a, a lot of different cell types. So we found different kind of progenitors, such as radial glia and intermediate progenitors and different kinds of neurons of the forebrain, including excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. 
And we did this identification by comparing our data set with the published data set of human fetal cortex, published by the Pixel Lab. <coughs> Um, so something just to show you something you could do with this data set. So we cross our data set with the published data set of uh, um, genes associated, for example, with autism. And you can do that with a lot of different diseases. And so, for example, you can see where, in which of these cell population, the genes associated with your favorite disease are basically expressed. Because so far, no one really knows. For example, if we think about autism, we do not really know what are the cell types that are affected by this disorder. And so this is really a nice tool to understand what are the cell types that are mostly affected, for example, by some specific genes and mutation. Another thing one could do, and we are currently doing, is that if you have a specific mutation you want to study with these uh, brain organoids, even though they are heterogeneous, as I said, you can basically focus on one specific population that you find after your single cell sequencing and try to compare the transcriptomic profile of your wild type cells and your mutant cells and do this kind of uh, comparison that <coughs> overcomes the problem of the variability to some extent. So also then we focus on the retina cluster and what we found, so we compare also our data with the published data set on endogenous retina cells. And we found that in our organoids, there are a lot of different retinal cell types. Actually, all the cell types present in the human retina. So you can see here, they are all present. This is really amazing if you think that these cells self-organize and they start from pluripotestant cells. And so, and also we found, I would like to mention, cell types such as Mueller glia, for example, of mature photoreceptors that are pre present only at very later stage of human eye development. And uh, so we really wanted to understand, I mean, we were surprised because some of these cell types are really present only in the postnatal retina. So we wanted to understand if, when in the organized development these cell types arise. And so we also did single cell sequencing on three months old organoids, and we compared them with six months old organoids. And uh, so now, for example, if we focus on this retina cluster, you can see that market for cell types such as bipolar cells and urea cells are only expressed, for example, at six months and not at three months. And same goes for the for brain cluster. Cell types that we know are generated later during cortical brain development, such as callosal neurons, they are present only in organoids that are six months old. And so this tells us that it is really important to culture these organoids for a very extended time if you really want to model these high order. Uh, these disorders that affect higher the function of the brain. Because if you model them in organisms that are only three months old, you will not have all the cell types that are present in the, in the, actually in the human complex. Uh, so these organoids, our organoids with our protocol, not only survive for a very long time, but actually over time they keep on generating different cell types. And the cellular diversity increases. And this is another example. So, we look specifically at the cluster of photoreceptors in our culture, and what you can see here is that um, there is, in the organisms that are six months old, there is this cluster in which basically all the cells belong to the organisms that are six months old, with the exception of this one. And we found that this cluster that is only present at six months actually contain photoreceptors that are equipped with the machinery to be photosensitive. And this is, yeah, this was very interesting for us. But then, okay, also, uh, we thought, okay, these organoids, at least from a transcription point of view, these cells look very mature. What happens if we look also at stru structural features that are expressed in neurons, such as synapses and dendritic spans? And so, as you can see here, this is a uh, marker, synapse one, is a presynaptic marker. And we found that over time, the increase of, uh, there is an increase in synapse one. You can see clearly that at one month, there is no expression of synapses synapse in one. And this, again, is really consistent with what happened in the human fetal brain. At the beginning, of course, you don't have synapses. And um, we found different kind of synapses, both GABAergic and glutamatergic. And in collaboration with the Lippmann lab, uh, we perform also uh, EM, electron microscopy. And so as you can see here, we were able to trace these beautiful synapses. So here in, in red, you can see axons. Uh, sorry, dendrites, and these in blue are axons with these synaptic vesicles that you can see here. 
And uh, also, something that is nice is that we counted the number of synapses in our eight month old organoids, and the number of synapses is actually comparable to the number that you find in the human fetal cortex uh, of the human um, fetal brain when it's eight months. And also, um, so for those of you that work with IPS, you, that, uh, you for sure know that it's very hard to make in culture dendritic spines. So the dendritic spines, because these neurons that are, uh, come from pluripotent stem cells are really embryonic-like, and the dendritic spines are, spines are really a feature of mature neurons. And so we were interested in understanding whether our organs were also able to make spines, <coughs> and we actually found that 30 out of the 100 synapses we trace are made on spines. And so here you can see a reconstruction of, um, so you see, sorry, the movie is a bit slow, but you see this uh, yellow dendrite and the <coughs> red dendrite that are able to make spines, that make synapses, basically on these axons. So you can see here this protrusion that basically are spines. <coughs> yeah. But yeah, I'm telling this also because we believe this is very important. Having spines in these organs is very important because we know that neuropsychiatric disorders also involve dysfunction in uh, uh, spines formation and remodeling. And so we believe that this is a model that can actually help with modeling those specific aspects of these disorders. And, um, and then we also were interested in understanding what was the electrophysiological profile of our organoids. And so John Sherwood, that is a postdoc in our lab, set up in collaboration with Ed Boyden, a very nice system to perform <coughs> call, uh, recording from brain organoids. So this is a multi electrode array. Um, it, it's actually, this can be scaled up up to 1,000 probing sites. So you have a lot of probing sites, and you can simultaneously record from this microelectrode array the activity of the organoids without slicing them. Because the whole point of having organoids is that they are three-dimensional structures, so we don't really want to slice them. And what we found was that at four months, those organoids do not display any activity. But then if you wait long enough, you can see uh, this very nice spike arising. We also found that um, after MBQX administration, the population spike rate decreased. And this is actually in agreement with the fact that these uh, neurons inside the organoids over time actually make synapses that are functional. And we also found that neurons in our organoids fire in a coordinated fashion. So this means that they are, or neurons in our organs are mature enough to actually make spontaneously active neuronal networks, and so they fire together. And again, this is an aspect if you want a modern neuropsychiatric disorder that you want something you want to have in your culture. So um, yes, this is basically my, my last slide. So what we found, and I show you at the beginning that basically we have this functional photoreceptor at this from a transcription point of view. And so we wanted really to see whether they were really able to respond to light. And so we did perform um, recording of, from our organoids. Uh, and then before and after light stimulation, what we found is that, you, as you can see here, following light stimulation, the activity of our organoids was actually affected. So our organoids are sensitive to light. And this is very nice because it's kind of they are almost able to have this self-emergent sensory system in them. So if you want to model really subtle aspect of human network development, it's, we believe this is a very nice system because it allows that. And so I would like to conclude by summarizing our findings. So we've been able to develop this protocol that allows long-term culture of organoids. And over time, organoids mature, and they keep on generating different cell types. And um, also, they um, show spontaneous uh, network activity. And this network activity can be also modulated by light. Um, yes, and with this, I would like to acknowledge all of the people in my lab, especially my mentor, Paula Lotta, that is a very fantastic mentor. She's been very helpful and supportive during for, uh, the project, of, all the stages of the project, and all the people in the lab involved in the project, and all our collaborators. Thank you all for your attention.